Sheep Pregnancy Scanning webinar. This webinar is brought to you by Leading Sheep, which is a partnership between Australian Wool Innovation, the Queensland Government and AgForce. It's great to see everyone here, here today. So our agenda today is that we have um, Pat Haggerty from Colyana at Longreach who's going to talk about his experiences with scanning and Pat will talk for about 10 minutes and then we'll have a brief question time just for any specific questions for Pat after Pat gets his question. <laughs> and then after Pat talks, we'll have uh, Chris Shands who's, at New, who's with the New South Wales DPI, DPI at Glen Innes and he's going to talk about using scanning as a management tool to lift land survival and then there'll be a, question, a, a longer question time then so then you can ask questions of Chris and Pat there as well. Um, and then I'll give a brief uh, conclusion for five minutes and hopefully we will be all finished by about two o'clock. So now I will hand over to Pat. Okay, thanks Nicole. Yeah, as uh, Nicole said, my name's Pat Hegarty, 140 kilometres west of Longreach in western Queensland. We have probably 13,500 hectares. We run around 8 to 9,000 sheep comprising approximately 3,000 breeding ewes, similar number of weathers and progeny from those ewes. We began scanning here at Colonia in 2004. Um, we thought it was going to be a good tool to, and I still do think it's a great tool to help you try and increase your production. When we began in 2004 we were using the local vet in town who was operating with a uh, a VE machine and that was good, did a good job, um, had good results with that and we um, actually scanned for twins in those first two years and as you can see on the screen there those were the results of those from that uh, twin scanning. The result wasn't huge, I didn't feel um, for ewes that were scanned with twins. Around about 18 to 20 percent of our ewes were, were, were scanned in land with twins and then we were getting those kind of percentages from them. We went away from using the local vet two years later simply because it was a little bit expensive and we couldn't get the people to operate it. We needed about five offsiders to muster and take ewes away and uh, we had to tip the ewes over in the VE machine. So we needed quite a few people and just finding the people became very difficult plus it was a little expensive to pay them all. So we stopped using that guy and we started using Sam Usher from down at Morven with his uh, automatic drafting system. At the same time we also decided that we wouldn't scan for twins because we were having a little bit of problem, just didn't feel that we were set up well enough for it. We um, were landing in fairly big paddocks and some of those paddocks had main roads through them and water's right beside the main roads and it wasn't overly successful. I didn't feel I thought we were losing a lot of lamb simply because we weren't set up well enough. Now we continued to go ahead and scan each year and we always sold our dries off. We sell the lot including maidens each year. We did keep those um, dries one year and rejoined them but we only got about 60 percent out of those dry ewes and it left us with a small number of lambs that were totally out of sync with everything else. So we wanted to get away from that and we simply just sell everything now, sell all the drives off. Um, I do believe scanning is a, a fantastic tool to use in the management of your use and the management of your business. Um, a lot of people ask me why we scan every year and I believe it's a great tool to know if your rams are doing the job and whether your ewes are also doing the job. We're generally scanning here around about 93 to 94 percent average, have all the way through, and um, we're pretty happy with that result. And I just feel if you don't scan, you really don't know. If you don't get lambs down the track, you really don't know if it's because your rams weren't fertile, your rams weren't doing the job, or there was something wrong with your ewes, or the dingoes were chasing the daylights out of your ewes, or whatever. But if you're getting good scanning results, at least you know they've got them in land. So um, 
We then move on down to uh, the nutritional side of it. And I don't want to dwell on this. I know it's not a webinar on feeding sheep, but I'm very big on feeding, <coughs> excuse me, feeding pregnant ewes. And we've got, I like to think we've got bigger and better at it over the last few years. And we're actually this year going to scan for twins again for the first time for about six years simply because we feel that we're in a better position to manage those ewes correctly. Um, as I said, we were getting really good scanning results nearly all the time that we've been scanning. We've never really had a bad scanning year, but we weren't getting the lambs, and we were getting so frustrated with that because we knew the ewes had the lambs on board, and we were losing them. And the biggest problem I felt was nutrition. Well, it was twofold. To be honest, nutrition and predators. Nutrition, I think, was probably about 70% of the problem and probably 30% predators. So we do a lot of work on predators and a lot of work on nutrition. So um, in recent years, we've uh, done a lot of subdivisional fencing on our property, and we've now got a lot more small paddocks set up with numerous waters. Most would have three waters in them. Most of those paddocks are around about 2,000 acres and we would run sort of four to five hundred ewes in those paddocks with three waters. And just uh, two years ago we moved on to, we used the services of a sheep nutritionist called Dr John Milton in Western Australia, who's been a big help to us in uh, trying to get the nutrition right. I don't believe there's any point in scanning sheep if you're not going to look after those ewes once, they've, once you've proved that they're in lamb and once you've got them all 100% pregnant and ready to go, and at the same time I don't believe there's any point in feeding sheep if you don't scan them, because you're probably feeding a lot of sheep that aren't, aren't pregnant and aren't going to rear you a lamb. And another point we found with scanning too was that um, a lot of ewes were getting, not, not so much a lot of ewes, but a percentage of ewes were scanning in lamb and not actually rearing those lambs. And we found that a great tool early in the piece. It's not such a problem now because we like to think we've sorted a lot of those ewes out. But we were scanning the, scanning the ewes and then later on after they dropped the lambs we used to wet and dry and you'd find that there's quite a few ewes coming through that weren't actually rearing their lambs. And we sold them all off to the meatworks. But usually they were the maddest ones, the ones that want to jump the fence or will burrow up under the sheep in the classing race or whatever. So we've I think scanning is a great tool to sort a lot of those sheep out because if you've got mad sheep like that, they're the first things to run away when you go out to check a water trough or to um, check waters or whatever, and they usually take everything with them, especially maiden ewes, uh, notorious for that. So I uh, just want to move on to this, um, you know, the, um, sorry, the uh, nutritional side of it. As I do think that's important, as I said, we consulted with Dr. John Milton and he got us onto the grain feeding. We feed a lot of corn now to our ewes. And we started by feeding that on the ground back in sort of 2004, 5, 6 in, at that time and was reasonably successful for a couple of years. But um, we got into a lot of trouble with the sheep chasing us for it and we lost a lot of lambs because of that. The ewes would run away and leave the lambs behind and chase the feed vehicle. So the last couple of years we've invested a lot of money in feeding, feeding bins. That bin you can see on the screen there, we've got 32 of those now on our place and we place one of those at every water, put corn in those and we feed those ewes about two kilos of corn a week plus a mineral lick as well in tyres beside, beside the feeders and that has been working very well for us. In that picture also you can see some alpacas. We run alpacas around about five or six alpacas in with our ewes as a, as a guardian against the uh, wild dogs and foxes. We also do a lot of 1080 baiting. We probably bait about seven times a year, particularly uh, through lambing. Prior and during lambing we would bait at least every month to try and keep the predators down, pigs, foxes and dogs. And last year we uh, invested in those silos, you can see there, the story of grain. And that there is a model of ewes that have been on that program last year. That's only a small mob there, small mob of stud ewes, only 100 ewes in that mob, but that mob of ewes read 133%. And interestingly, when we scanned those ewes, 
there was 40% of those scanned in land with twins and we read 133% out of those used. So we're very happy with that result. And it just, uh, just uh, gets your confidence up that you can do good things with the sheep. I feel if a hundred years can do that, why can't a thousand or a couple of thousand? So we're sort of pretty confident now that we've got a good program going to uh, supplement those ewes once they are all pregnant and ready to go. Another, another little thing we're doing now, we're uh, starting to breed a few rams here and this year, 2012, we actually joined some young rams at seven months of age to a mob of ewes. We joined them pretty heavily at about 4%. So we'd be able to use the scanning to see how successful that experiment was. We just feel that those little rams have got a lot of genetic potential. And if we can join them very early like that, we can make use of their genetic potential potential a year earlier. So we will scan that mobby use up on their own and get engage how that experiment went. Nicole, I'm probably nearly out of time, am I? Yeah, just about that. Okay, well that's nearly it for me. I've just about covered everything there. We do um, we do drench our ewes quite a lot and we always give them a six in one vaccine at scanning. Usually when the ewes are in the cradle being scanned, we uh, got an operator up there with a vaccination needle and we always give the ewes a six in one and then recent years we've been using a ewe guard which is a six in one and a, and a drench as well. We try to do everything possible to to get those ewes in lamb and also to rear those lambs once they're, once they're uh, been conceived and ready to go. So that's about it for me, Nicole, at this stage, unless there's any questions. Thank you. And Pat, we do already have one question in the question box, which I think you may have answered already, but um, how many alpacas to a mob of ewes do you run? Thanks, Nicole. Usually around five or six. We've got... Uh, 32 alpacas at the moment. We've got some more ordered, but um, and we only sort of run them on the back end of our place against where the ranges are. Uh, so you, normally about five to six in each mob, except that okay. small. Sorry, that small mob where I showed you there earlier. With uh, that hundred, they only had three in there. There was a male alpaca and two females with those back where that yep. photo was. So five or six to a mob of what size, do you? About 500 years. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from um, Duncan was, what was the twin percentage in the stud 100 years? There was 40, 40 years, or 100 years, and 40 of them were scanned with twins. And then we read 133 lambs, basically, in that 100 years. So we read 33 of that 40 in the twinness. Does that make sense? Yep. That's the same mob that's in that photo there. That's the ones that had the 133, which was a fantastic result for us. We'd never had a percentage like that in our lives. Okay, so Will Hobbs has a question for you, Pat, so I'll just... Unmute Will. Yeah, good night, Pat. Uh, Will Hobbs here. Um, just checking something. Um, you say you're losing uh, lamb after scanning uh, previously. What was the percentage roughly, you think, um, without feeding? Um, what was the percentage you think you're averaging? You're, you're averaging 90, 93 to 95% scanning in lamb. So what sort of percentage are you getting without feeding? Uh, very. We... Um our last, like our 10 year average, 85% since uh, yeah. Yeah. since 2000, but uh, we had, in that we had some very bad lambings. In 07 we only marked 48% of lambs out of, out of uh, scanned ewes and in 2009 only 56. I'm sure the reason was that the fishing was just, like we had some falling rain through the winter and the there was just no goodness in the feed and we weren't, weren't feeding enough um, grain or lick. Well, was the problem and they just fell to pieces on us. Just didn't start early enough. Yeah, yeah. And, and with, with the, with the uh, feeding now in your paddocks, the ones you're feeding, uh, what sort of percentage um, from the 93 95% scan in lamb, uh, what are you sort of getting uh, lambs marked percentage-wise? 
now with the stadium? Last year, uh, we averaged 110 club with our... Um, 110 percent, yep. 106 last year, and that varied from the 33 in those little mobs down to 92 in Maidens. Had, um, mm -hmm. The well, the mobs of flock years that were 109 and another 117, but we didn't twin any of them. They would just uh, stand present, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, it sounds like you're, 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 you're having the same. You're, this is the mirror of what we're, operation that we're doing, I think. Yeah, pretty well the same. Same sort of results I'm, I'm seeing here, yeah. Um, yeah, I think yeah. since we've started feeding that grain in those feeders, the stocks got so quiet and that just having the access do it all the time, like 24/7, and that's working so much better than it ever did when we threw it on the ground, and we're not disturbing yep. them. Yep. Uh, yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. No, interesting. Hello. Right, eh? Okay. No, that's that's good. Have you have you tried marama dogs? No, I haven't. There's a few people around that have. Yep. And I asked Ninny. I think Ninny's on there today. He's had great success with them up at Hewenden, but um, I haven't because I don't have any. Keep around me. I'm pretty much surrounded by cattle, and I just felt that I was needed to bait for pigs. Get a lot yep. of pigs with a lot of channels, and I still needed to still needed to bait. I felt, and I didn't want to just um, buy the dogs because I was fearful of baiting them. And I know a few guys that have got them far from here, the Maremas, and they won't bait anymore, and they're still losing a lot of sheep simply because they yep. can't do yeah. all of it. I've got to do all those things to try and control the predators. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. No, thanks for that. That's that's on right now. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, Will. Good work. So, Pat, just one final question before we move on to Chris's presentation. How long are you joining for? Uh, joined for three cycles, which is fifty-one days or so around seven weeks. Nicole, at this stage. Thank you. So. As I said, Chris is going to talk about using scanning as a management tool to lift lamb survival and is based in Glen Innes in New South Wales. Um, just prior to Chris starting his presentation, he had just a few questions that he would like to ask you, the audience. Um, so I'm going to launch some polls. And so when I do, I'll launch the first one now. If you can just click on the answer on your screen. So the first poll is, do you currently scan your sheep? So if you can just click yes or no, um, I'll just give you a, a few more seconds so we make sure we're giving everyone enough enough time. And we might close it off in five, four, three, two, one. So here are the results. So 38% of participants scan their sheep and 62% currently do not. So the next poll, if you do scan, for those who said yes, how long have you been scanning for? One to two years, three to five years or longer? I'll just give you a few moments. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'll close that one. So of those, I think it was 32 percent people said they were scanning. 20 percent have been scanning for one to two years. 40 percent for three to five years, and 40 percent for longer. So one last poll before we get started. Of those, once again, of those who are scanning, where have you seen the benefits to your flock? And please tick all that apply to increase flock reproduction rate ease of managing lambing mobs, identifying and culling dry ewes, better nutrition of pregnant ewes and selection replacement hobbits from twinners. So if you can just, for those who are scanning, if you just wanted to click on whichever of those that apply to you, the benefits you've seen. So just another five seconds to vote. Five, four, three, two, one. So I'll close that one off. And so the results here are that 60% of people have seen a better flock reproduction rate, 60% have a better ease of managing their lambing mobs, 100% have found benefit in identifying and culling their dry ewes, 100% have found benefit in better nutrition of their pregnant ewes, and 20% have 
found benefit in selecting their replacements from, from those who are, who are twinning. So thank, thank you for that. At the end of Chris's presentation, there's one more poll that we'd like you to do. So now um, I'll hand back over to Chris. He'll go through his, his presentation. Over to you, Chris. Okay, thanks Nicole for the invitation to present. This is my first time doing a webinar, so it all seems uh, like things are running pretty well uh, so far. Um, this uh, presentation of mine is really based on a workshop that we run called Managing Scanned Use, and a few of the slides that I'll be using today are uh, from that, that workshop, and that workshop's been run all over the sheep reducing uh, states, and quite a few of those activities in Queensland, I guess, over the years. So I probably have met some of uh, the, the, and I do know some of the people on the attendees list, so um, that's really good. I guess what we're looking at really with um, using scanning as a management tool is, you know, the underlying reason is to really lift lamb survival, and what we're seeing is most of our lambs dying at or around birth, so I think what Pat has explained earlier on is really looking at addressing that issue, and by feeding those ewes in late pregnancy, he's really preparing those ewes for lambing. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that as we as we go through the presentation. Um, go through the poll questions. This is the state of our industry at the moment. Um, I guess most people have got that one up now. But what we're seeing is a breeding flock of about 45 to 47 million ewes producing enough replacements and or um, prime lambs indirectly from merinos, I guess, but also prime lamb mothers to meet a pretty significant demand for sheep meat products. And with the Australian dollar being relatively high, uh, this sheep meat demand has still still been uh, continuing significantly. And this is obviously one of the reasons why sheep prices and the dem and the demand for for mutton and lamb products is uh, remaining so high. Even though we've seen some quite significant changes in the in the uh, prices being paid at abattoir level, and uh, MLA, RWI, the sheep CRC, those sorts of people are really quite concerned that uh, we might might be able to maintain the um, supply to to meet these markets. So we're in an interesting situation. I'll move on to the next slide. So what are some of the things you can do in terms of um, increasing the conception rate and looking at, at lamb survival. And I guess there's sort of two main uh, areas that I'd be uh, specifically looking at. Um, if you're looking at increasing the conception rate, and a lot of people, a lot of producers don't seem to have too much difficulty, depending on their production system, but getting quite a lot of ewes pregnant. Um, you know, drought years are an, another um, you know, different management consideration, but in, in sheep that are normally run in an annual program, then getting plenty of them pregnant doesn't seem to be too, too big an issue. But there is a very strong relationship between the conception rate of ewes and their condition or fat score. So physically weaning and then getting the condition back on the ewes for the next joining is a really important management opportunity to make sure that there's lots of ewes pregnant there so that when the scanner does come along, you've got some, uh, some good, good results there. Um, so in terms of knowing the condition score of your ewes, I reckon there's two times of the year when it's really important. One is at weaning time, so that you can actually, you know, if you've got ewes that are in two condition score or, you know, maybe two and a half, um, then you've got an opportunity to get them back in condition for the next joining. And by drafting uh, ewes that might have reared twins if you've been scanning for a while and you'd be pretty sure that those ewes are likely to have you know, be, be lighter than ewes that might have reared a single. So there's the challenge of then um, lifting that that um, condition score from weaning through to the next joining. The other time when it's really important to know the fat score or the condition score of ewes, and that is the time at around about uh, when scanning occurs, because if those ewes are a bit skinnier um, than what you'd like at scanning time, then you've got a great opportunity of being able to um, you know, put some feeding management into place to make sure that those ewes that might be a bit lighter, at least they're ready to lamb and in the conditions that they, they need to be. So looking at increasing lamb survival, again, 
there's a strong relationship between the, the condition score of the ewe in late pregnancy and lamb survival. And I guess if you know uh, through scanning you know, what's carrying a single, what's carrying a twin, then there is a, a good opportunity there of being able to feed accordingly, whether it's on pasture or, or whether it's through some strategic supplementary feeding, then um, often you can get some pretty good survival results there. And I think Pat's probably outlined that a bit as well. Um, the other opportunity it gives you is to select the better performing ewes, those ewes that are likely to have more lambs and are better mothers, and then looking at selecting progeny from those ewes that can come back in as replacements so that they've they're, you know, got a pretty strong potential to be able to uh, uh, have replacements which will contribute well to, to the flock. The question about genetics, which I've got a little uh, heading there, genetics in reproduction isn't uh, very encouraging in terms of uh, being able to make great inroads for lifting reproduction by just selecting for number of lambs weaned. We have much better chance of, of lifting um, lifting those results by selecting ewes that have reared twins and their progeny are much more likely to rear twins as well. So move on to the next slide. So just to go through the scanning uh, process, um, ultrasound scanning helps you to establish pregnancy status. It then gives you the chance of managing those groups a bit differently. The scanner uh, is looking at, I guess, two things. For just wet and drying, they're looking for fluid development in the uterus, so they can then say that that ewe's pregnant or not pregnant. And for then identifying twins and singles, they're actually looking for developing skeletal parts, so that they're looking at two rib cages or two, two um, heads or beating hearts in the uh, the use that they're scanning. Um, for improved accuracy, I guess it's probably better if the ewes are joined for shorter shorter periods. So two cycles is sort of 35 days. Um, certainly three cycles is not uh, too much of a, a greater uh, problem for the scanners. The only thing is that some of those ewes that might have joined much later uh, might be a bit more difficult to tell whether they're carrying twins or singles, but most of the scanners should pick up that they're pregnant. Um, the ewes should be off feed for about four hours. That just empties the bladder so that the scanner's got a good good um, uh, picture. Um, obviously, you know, the scanners can, can get through quite a few thousand sheep in a day, so you need a decent set of yards and the sheep need to flow well, reduce the dust uh, from an oh &S point of view, and then a bit of labour, obviously, to get the, the sheep through. The costs it can be a bit variable, but sort of 60 cents for around about 60 cents for wet and drying, and then 80 cents for twin, twin and uh, multiple uh, scanning. Um, then there could be obviously a travelling cost, especially in some of those um, you know more distant areas in central and western Queensland. The 60 cents for wet and dry and 80 cents for twins and singles is really an adjustment for the uh, reduced throughput for the twins and singles, so that's why the cost increases a little bit there. I'll go to the next slide. So the current process, um, so we're scanning for pregnant or non-pregnant, wet or dry, that gives you the chance to rejoin them, but be careful if you do rejoin when those ewes may well lamb, and I think Pat's hit it on the head, um, you know, culling ewes that are dry tends to lift the overall reproduction rate of the flock. You can run them as a dry, um, as a wool cutter, and I guess uh, with the mutton prices have, having been pretty strong, then there's a bit of a temptation to sell them and get some ready cash. Um, scanning for litter size, single or twin bearing. Um, once the scanner comes along and starts to go through a few, a few pens of animals, then I guess that'll give you a pretty good idea if you've got more than about 10% of those used carrying twins. So as a rule of thumb, um, probably not worth scanning for twins and singles if there's less than around about 10% of those ewes carrying twins. Um, and then obviously with the scanning that allows you to manage your twins and your sing single bearing ewes a bit differently. Um, other areas that the scanners uh, perform these days is identifying the first and second cycle single bearing ewes. And though the idea of that is, is for producers, I guess, in more favourable, well, different pasture conditions where those lambs can get very big in the last two to three weeks before they're due to lamb, that's really to try to regulate the weight of the second cycle single bearing ewes uh, lambs. 
Oh, look, the other area which is uh, a lot of producers are really cottoning onto with scanning is, no, is maybe not so much scanning for twins and singles, but being able to identify ewes that are uh, that are going to lamb early, and then the, those ewes that are going to lamb later. So it means then that you can draft up your ewe groups and say, right, uh, this mob are going to lamb in the next three weeks. I don't have to worry about the rest of them for another month or so before they'll they'll be coming on. So it just means then for supervision, management, and even supplementary feeding, then you can really target that feeding at the ewes that need it sort of now, and then uh, as those later uh, joined ewes um, you know, get approach lambing, then you would then uh, you know, bring the feed cart out or the supplementary feeding or put them into their lambing paddocks at a, a bit of a later stage. So it really does provide a fair bit of flexibility uh, in terms of being able to manage those flocks. So um, there's a, just a photo up there of the old way of scanning. Um, this is the funny old machine and belly wooling the U and then locking her up in a contraption. If we were still scanning like that, then it wouldn't be, the system wouldn't have progressed very far. But looking today at um, this is pretty much how most of the scanning contractors operate. They've got a, a Ivy scan machine, the blue machine sitting there on the desk, and they're developing, generating photographs. Um, or well, sorry, pictures up on on the screen. So it's a sector scan. You can see the the, the large arc on the screen there. That's the arc uh, with the ultrasound waves uh, being pushed through into the uterus and looking at developing up some some pictures there. You see the Prattley uh, gear, which is there holding the the sheep, and then the handle at the top there, uh, which is the counter for uh, how your sort of invoice is is made up. So the operator will press one, two, or zero, depending on how they're scanning up um, as to what's pregnant and what's not pregnant, uh, and then the animals can pass through fairly quickly. So moving on to the next slide, dry ewes. Around 5% of ewes will be dry in any, any year. A lot of merino people aren't too worried if it's a bit more than that because they've got the, you know, the opportunity as wool cutters, but um, for the meat sheep people then, that's obviously a pretty strong priority to get as many lambs out of those ewes. We reckon if there's more than about 7% uh, dry, there's likely to be a bit of a fertility problem. And 90% of the reasons that that occurs is because of the fat score of the condition score of the ewe and the live weight adjoining. And the other 10% is sort of ram fertility and contact with ewes. So I always say to my producers, you know, when you're joining, get around your use, make sure the rams are with the use and, and joining. Now we talked about some of those options, culling and rejoining. If you want to give the your dry use a second chance, then that's not that, that's not a bad way to go. Put a permanent ear notch in them, so they'll when they turn up the next year, you'll you'll see that they're um, that they were dry the previous year. And then culling your dry use will help to increase the net pre-production rate of the flock a bit if you identify it lamb marking time or at weaning time, ewes that have failed to rear through wet and drying, then that'll certainly help to lift the reproduction rate of the flock a bit more. And that's what Pat was saying about putting some pressure on reproductive characteristics, and that's why identifying them and culling those ewes will help to lift the reproduction rate of that flock. The next slide, scanning for litter size, single or twin bearing needs to be done by about day 90 from the start of joining. So if you leave it much later, it's hard for the scanners to actually see more than one fetus there. The lambs in from sort of around about that day 90, they sit very very still. They're, they're only oxygenated at about 30% of what the ewes uh, normally take in, so they don't move around much. If you scan them much later and you need to provides the management, then it doesn't give you enough time to um, you know, develop a feeding program or um, you know, put, put sheep into some different pastures which will benefit them. Uh, but keep in mind they can be scanned for litter size down to about 70 days. Um, and uh, But then some of those ewes may only be about 40 days pregnant, which just makes it a bit more difficult for the scanner to identify twins and singles. Now, the use of pregnancy scanning information, um, if you think about your your, your best and worst performance, certainly the worst performance are your dry ewes and those that fail to rear, but the best performance performers in your flock are those ewes that um, have a higher reproduction rate and generally they're the older ewes. 
which then means if you keep those in the flock for an extra year, you then need to bring in fewer maiden ewes into the flock, uh, and they're, they're the ewes that won't have anywhere near as many lambs. Um, and then obviously the scanning helps you to manage those different man uh, parts of the flock um, a little bit differently. So just a couple of reasons why scanning and, and uh, the condition score of, of uh, the ewes leading up to lambing is so important. If you look at the blue line, um, if I get this spot going, this blue line through here, if you look at um, uh, single lambs and the condition score of the ewes, then ewes that are in two or three condition score, in most cases, will probably rear you know, singles relatively well. If you, though, look at uh, ewes that are carrying twins, you know, ewes that are in this two to three condition score will probably rear less than half of their lambs. And depending on the environment, then that's, that's um, obviously a difficult one. If you get them up to three score, you prepare them for lambing, then they're going to rear more of their, more of their lambs. If we look at the next slide, which is lamb birth weight in terms of lamb survival, and this is some lifetime wool research that was uh, conducted a few years ago now, but if you look at the average birth weight in this trial was 4.9 kilos, so just around about 5. If you got those singles too heavy, then we get into that sort of area a little bit above 6, then we were seeing more lambs dying from dystochia. So the, the message for that research really was to be careful that you don't get your single lambs too big in, in the better seasons. And look, for certainly people in central and western Queensland, that's not such a big issue, but in some of the better pasture or more reliable rainfall country, then it can be a bit of an issue. If we look at the tweeners, uh, averaging average weight of 3.7, which was at this point here. If we were to feed the ewes more than they really needed in late pregnancy, and we got the lamb birth weights up to say 4.2, then we're certainly not getting into that risk area of dystopia, but we're lifting lamb survival quite enormously, and we're achieving that by lambs that are you know, a bit more vigorous at birth because they've got a heavier birth weight. They can shiver more and, and get themselves going if the weather's a bit cold when they're being born. And we've got the ewe prepared for lambing so that she's got milk in her udder. And they're the really important issues in terms of lamb survival. So the next slide, just looking at our single bearing ewes, get them scanned up. And uh, if they're in sort of condition score two and a half or three, they generally shouldn't be a problem in terms of their nutrition might want to just sort of put them into a prepared lambing paddock, which might have had the, the predators controlled in it, some fox baiting and, and some shooting, and get rid of the feral pigs would be a great thing. But you can certainly lamb large mobs of single bearing ewes together without any mismothering occurring. So they pretty well look after themselves unless they're in very skinny condition, and then you're likely to see um, more, yeah, more problems occurring. And if we go on to the twin bearing ewes, the condition score of those ewes, and that's what I said at the beginning, the condition score at scanning time is so important, especially for these twinners. So if those ewes are you know, in that two condition score or fat score sort of category, I'd be really thinking I needed to get the, the feed cart out. Now I know in, in central or western Queensland it's not, not always uh, you know, not always able to lamb on green feed, but gee whiz, green is the really the you know, the, the pasture which will aid enormously in lamb survival and it then means that you, if you've got some green when you're lambing you haven't got the amount of uh, supplementary feed to, to provide. So I think the supplement that Pat was talking about um, really does help to put milk in the udder. It lifts uh, lamb birth weight so that the lambs have just got that extra half kilo on them to be able to um, survive a bit more effectively. and. Uh, it will help to reduce pregnancy toxemia in those years when feed's a bit scarce and the ewes may be um, spending a bit of time uh, scouring paddocks for that bit of extra feed. So that really does help. Um, in in uh, in the I guess more settled areas, then you know, moving your twinners into the lambing paddocks to give the ewes a bit of a chance to work out where they're going to lamb is useful. Lamb them in small mobs and. Some of the producers who've been through our workshops are, um, are saying back to us that they prefer to land their twin bearing ewes in smaller mobs than what we've recommended there is about 250. Um, they're saying they're much better lamb survival in mobs of 100 to 150 ewes. So if you're able to manage those 
smaller smaller groups, then you'll find that lamp survival will improve significantly. And look, stocking rates for uh, more settled areas, I guess, 18 use per hectare in prepared lambing paddocks just really gives enough space and privacy for those used to lamb on. And we're obviously um, selecting lambing paddocks with plenty of feed to meet those nutritional targets. So the next slide, if you are going to scan, you've really got to get in and do some active management. Um, you can see the orange line running through there is the condition score or fat score profile. At scanning time, if those ewes have lost a bit of condition, then you'll need to supplement them to get them up and get them ready for lambing. And we can see through that, that profile that there is a variation in, in condition score through the year. The red mark down the bottom here, if your ewes are you know, up to two condition score, then they're much more likely to die leading up to the point of lambing because of the stresses of pregnancy. And I guess I've put in there for a winter lambing, we need to have some green feed there. So if you're going to achieve some of those points, you'll tend to lift lamb survival quite well. So I guess just to sort of summarise, you need to get the basics right. You now the time of weaning to get the condition back on the ewes is obviously so important and the condition score and live weight of those ewes that joining will really determine the uh, success of joining and how many lambs you're likely to get five months down the track. Ram health, um, you know, joining rams that, are, that have probably been um, jazzed up on some lupins before joining will really help to uh, improve the um, conception rate of those ewes. How long you leave the rams in for? Um, if ewes are in that sort of two and a half, three condition score for joining, then you'll find most of them will be pregnant in those first two cycles. So that's probably your biggest challenge is getting the condition on the ewes for joining. Look, predators and internal parasites, depending on where you are, uh, there's foxes all over the country who are trying to kill your lambs. Um, there's barber's pile worm that most people have experienced in the last couple of years of the wetter summers that are also trying to kill your ewes. So, um, you know, those two areas really do need to be addressed before a lot of success can be gained out of um, getting those extra lambs, you know, born and, and alive. Um, scanning information, look, it really does give you a much more control over what's happening in your flock and that flexibility. And what we're really trying to do is to optimise lamb birth weight, which will have a strong flow on to improving lamb survival. And just to finish up, um, the nutritional needs of the flock are important. The relationship between fat score or condition score um, in terms of lifting lamb survival and getting used pregnant is, is obviously pretty important. I think um, adjoining you need to think about where you're going to lamb your twinners if you're going to scan that way and uh, so, that, so that you can actually make sure those twin lambing paddocks are prepared. Um, in good seasons, we tend to see uh, in the better pasture areas, I guess, um, you know, uh, those singles getting pretty big, so we need to just try to moderate the weight on those singles. And in every season, I reckon you need to feed your twin bearing ewes a supplement of a couple of kilos a week of a cereal grain, and that should be fed three weeks out from lambing. So um, probably about five weeks of feeding, a couple of kilos a week. And if you do the sums on that, there's not a, not a a uh, huge amount of uh, cost involved there. Adopting that selective culling, keeping some older ewes in the flock for one extra lambing, providing they're sound uh, because they'll have more lambs for you. And look, I'm a really strong believer in developing an annual program so that things that you do today um, or that you might forget to do today, uh, you'll find that you'll pick up on so that um, you know, the program is well coordinated and, um, and you know you can uh, dot the I's and cross the T's. I think that's me, Nicole. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we've just, as I mentioned before, we've got one last poll for the audience to complete, which I will launch now. So how importantly do you rate reproduction in your flock? So please select one, very important, moderately important, or not a big deal. So if you can... Um, Click on which one you think reproduction is to your flock. I'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'll close that off and share the results. So 
everyone thinks reproduction is um, very important <laughs> today, which is good. <laughs> That's very good. Just to that, Carl, I forgot to mention, um, the, if you look at that website, the CRC with the management reproduction scanning, if, if uh, producers want to have a look on that, that website, it's got the list of scanning contractors um, for Queensland and, and obviously scanning contractors uh, from other states there. And I do know uh, of the four, four of the scanning contractors in Queensland, uh, there are a few, a few of the northern New South Wales blokes that slip under the water from time to time and do the odd job uh, just over. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so once again, it's now question time. So if anyone has a question, if you would like to raise your hand and then I will unmute you. Otherwise, you can type a question into the question box. So um, we have a question here. Um, so you can either ask a question of Chris or Pat, if you like. So we have a question already in here, and Pat, this is for you. It's the one from um, Helen Darlington. She she could hear us, but we couldn't hear her. So Pat, her question to you is regarding the two kg per head per feed per week for the ewes. How do you control intake per head with shy and dominant feeders? Pat, if you would like to answer that question. Okay, Nicole, that's a good question. Um, those feeders that we're using, are, they're, they're an advantage feeder made in Melbourne and they're actually a lick feeder and they don't actually have ad lib um, availability of the grain. There's, a, there's two adjustments on those feeders. There's a vertical and a horizontal one and there's a little channel between the two that you can adjust open or closed to govern the amount of feed that they eat. And through trial and error over the last couple of years, we've sort of managed to keep that at about two kilos. But as far as the shy and dominant feeders are concerned, I haven't done any work on that. They basically have to sort that out for themselves. But given that the um, feed is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I don't think that's a problem because the sheep was um, with corn, which is a fairly big grain. And but. Um, what we were planning to do this year when we, when we scan for twins, we're going to actually, those feeders have the ability then to adjust that gap. So if we wanted to give the twin use three or four kilos, we can. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, Pat, can I, can I make just one other comment on that one? What we yeah. found with the lick, with the lick feeders, um, the idea of the lick feeder is that they'll lick to get their ration and eventually their tongue gets pretty dry and their mouth gets dry and then they go off for water. So I guess the technique was then to put the lick feeder a bit away from the from the the water water source, whether it's a dam or a trough or tank or whatever, um, go off and have a drink here. Yeah, water's definitely not too close and um, I've stood there and watched them and they do actually manage it very well. You don't see them. The only time I've seen them bustling around is a couple of occasions when I've run out and I've gone out and refilled it. Provided it's there all the time, they seem to manage it very well and they'll stand back and wait until one steps back. As you say, they're only in there for a couple of minutes and their tongue gets dry and they step back and another one will go in. So I think they're a brilliant system, to be honest. Thank you. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, if you want to raise your hand and then I will unmute you or type it into the question box. Um, a couple of other questions, um, probably Chris, prior to... Um, I know you spoke influence what the scanners see, but maybe if you could just briefly um, summarise those again and if, if you do have any figures on um, how accurate scanning is. Okay. Um, what I guess we've found working with scanning contractors over the last few years is that for just wet and drying, you should expect pretty pretty accurate results. So there should be less than 1% you know, of views that those scanners would be finding that we're, we're, we're making mistakes on. So, you know, scanning for pregnant, pregnant or non-pregnant is is really their their stock and trade. So you find that there's not much inaccuracy there. Once you get into scanning for male producers that are five for singles and then scan for triplets and those sorts of numbers, then as the numbers go up for identifying the pregnancy status of them, the accuracies become less. But um, for for um, 
just twins and singles, normally you wouldn't expect more than about 5% variation there. And we are in the process through the sheep CRC running uh, training opportunities for scanning contractors and we've got another training, training uh, activity planned for later in the year. Thanks, Chris. Um, a question that's come through is why feed corn and not lupins to the ewes? You end up just with maybe a little bit of a reduction in the amount of balance of protein and energy uh, because of the, the cereal grains, the corns and the barleys and those sort of feeds are, you know, tend to be more of, a, more of an energy feed than a protein feed. But they do a great job in preparing the ewe for lambing and that's getting that milk in the udder. That is the real important reason to, when the ewe lambs standing over the lamb with milk just in the, in the tips of the teats there, if the lamb can grab onto that then survival of those lambs is, is almost assured. Yeah, Chris couldn't agree more. No, the main reason we uh, use the corn is, is purely price and distance from lupins. I know at the moment or in the recent times there have been lupins available down around Narromine and those places, but because we're right out in central western Queensland, most of the time lupins are available in South Australia or somewhere and it's very expensive to get them here. I did do quite a bit of work with Dr John Milton in WA on this and um, he basically advised me into corn for lupins, but purely on availability. Like we can sometimes get corn out of the uh, Burdekin area, which is not that far away from us. And when we do that corn, we generally uh, generally scan our ewes and we start them on the mineral lick immediately, which is probably six weeks before lambing, and then usually two to three weeks prior to to lambing, we start on that corn. With males, I usually start about three weeks before, and the old ewes to and that's been working very well the last two years. But that's the main reason for using the corn is it's just the availability and, and the price. We landed up here for about three fifty a tonne. And I think lupins would be way more than that. Thanks, Nicole. Just a, um, a comment here from Peter Lynch is that advantage lick feeders in Western Australia make a good feeder that can be used for lick feeding barley. That's correct. Sorry, yeah, we're using all advantage feeders at the moment. They're made in Melbourne and sent up in a flat pack and we put them together here, so I think they're a really great tool. They're not cheap by any means, but they're a, a great tool that will last a long time if they're looked after. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Uh, will Hobbs has his hand raised, so I'm just going to unmute Will and he can ask his question. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, uh, Chris, just um, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, just going off uh, accuracy, um, you said 1%. Um, just, uh, do you think it's to do, if, 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 if a scanner is doing a well above 1%, do you think it's to do a speed? Can they go too fast? Uh, look, there's lots of, there's lots of reasons. Um, I guess, yeah, speed is one issue. It's also the stage of pregnancy that the scanner um, gets to you know, see the use. The simplest thing, if you are going to get your use scanned, to try to maximise the accuracy is to really ring the scanner you know, when you put the rams out so that he can come to your place you know, at a, during the week when you'll get the most accurate result. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Yeah, no, I just, um, yeah, no, I just, yeah, right that's fine. That's, um, so what would you say a, um, a speed, the maximum speed a scanner should really do a day? Be accurate. Well, it depends on the setup. I, I know of some scanners that will, you know, scan 3,000 years and have time to knock off for a beer in the right. late afternoon. Yeah. Um, but with twins and singles, then it's a slower process because of they've got to take more time to, you know, see what's there. Yeah, okay. So I think to do with your equipment as well. I know that um, the scanners that are scanned with that machine that I showed on the photographs, their accuracy can be pretty good and their throughput's um, pretty pretty good as well. Also, I guess, just to do with the handling of the sheep, and I know that um, uh, Stan Ash's machine has a uh, compression, you know, compresses the ewes, or I've seen him scanning um, dorpers and that, that are 
need a bit of educating and um, you know those sheep are very well contained in, in his machine so he can um, you know get the get the probe on the right spot and um, mm. end up with a pretty good result. Okay, yep, yep. Now the other thing is um, on that question of squeeze brushes, um, using a sc um, scanning box, um, you know, or there's three ways of scanning, isn't it? Use, use the V machine, a squeeze box, or a, or just an ordinary uh, like a paddy box. Which is, do you think the, uh, the squeeze box is, um, uh, what's the stress level does that put on them? Do you think there's a lot of losses? Yeah, I, I look. I certainly think the industry moved research, away from the, the VE machine. Sorry? Uh, the, the, the industry's moved away from using the VE machine mm -hmm. to a greater yep. degree. Uh, That's because because the it's labor, labor, too slow in the labour, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the um, labour's, yeah. But, yeah. Mm. Has, has there been any studies at all? Has, has there been any Sorry, you go. There's, yeah. in, in New South Wales and Victoria, there's... Usually only the Prattley machines are used. Um, yep. The squeeze machine is really something I think that uh, Sam's probably developed and perfected a bit, especially for scanning dorpers uh, that might only be run in once or twice a year. Mm. I'm just wondering how, how um, we've noticed with, we've used a squeeze machine here, and yeah, I've just noticed that there's quite a few years ago. I think yeah, it's actually very. Um, not, not in good condition, you know. Um, it's all, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'm so testing it. Therefore, therefore, have a talk yeah. to your scanner and ask him to adjust it so that it's not, you know, crushing them too much. Yeah. We yep. we really yep. don't see many lamb losses after directly after scanning. It mm. really is the losses that are occurring during the lambing process, which is, you know, where those mm. lambs can be. Yep. yep. Okay. And the other question is. Um, there's a lot of uh, new scanners going around now that, that the producers can buy and scan their sheep themselves. Um, there's a couple around. There's um, uh, Dominsky scanner and um, uh, yeah. there's another one getting around too. What are they, what are they like in, in accuracy wise? I think in New South Wales, um, uh, Taper actually holding a course uh, in a couple of, in a week's time, I think. In, yeah, in, yeah. Um, uh, well, scanning. that's a very good question. I need to be a little careful how I answer it, but I'll tell you what: you pay for what you get. Yep. If you uh, if you don't spend much money on a, that sort of gear, then you're certainly not going to have anywhere near the level of accuracy. And the other problem with individuals scanning their sheep and maybe neighbours is the fact that they're just not putting enough through to continue proficiency and uh, and accuracy. You know, scanning right. contractors have set themselves up because they're doing 20, 50, 100,000 a year, and I know scanning contractors in Victoria that are doing three and 400,000 a year, so their mm. accuracy is, and, and throughput is happening every day. Mm. 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 Yep, yeah, okay. Right. Okay, yeah. Yep, no, that's, that's good. Okay, thanks for that. No worries at all. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Um, we have another question here from Phil Bell. Do you have any info on twin bearing ewes returning in lamb with twins the following year? I'd say probably to Chris. Yep, okay. Um, th the repeatability of ewes to have twins from one year to the next is is quite high, it's something like 30%. So if you did scan your ewes for, for twins and singles and you would obviously lamb those twin bearing ewes separately, uh, then if you were to follow those ewes through and providing you get them back in that you know, fat score or condition score three for the next joining, then you'll find that a lot of those ewes will have twins the following year. And the problem has been where those ewes have, haven't been looked up, looked after well enough from weaning through to the next joining, and they potentially can have twins and rear twins, but because they're a bit lighter, they don't cycle and have you know two eggs shed, which then can become the twins. Um, so they'll ovulate with one and only get you know have have one lamb. So yep, ewes that, that carry twins and rear twins are highly likely to do it in the following years, and they're the ewes that you should be looking at selecting replacements out of so that they can come back into your flock and contribute to uh, much more practical and, and reasonable um, 
you know, proper reproduction levels. Thanks, Chris. Uh, a question from um, Duncan Banks. Um, so either Chris or Pat, um, can someone comment about favour beans as a feed? Well, I can have a belt of that one. Fibers have been fed quite a lot. Um, a good level of protein and energy, not quite as similar as, as say, lupins because the starch content in your fibers tends to be a little bit more like grain, so they're not probably quite as safe to feed from a starch and a, um, a you know, digestive upsets in the, in the use of sort of grain poisoning type effect, but still really good feed. And if you can get them for, you know, a couple of hundred dollars a ton or thereabouts, um, you know, on farm, then yep, they're, they're great stuff to feed, and they won't miss one. They're a large grain, so they'll they'll get them all. Yeah, sorry, I'll just comment on that. Um, my experience and the advice that I've been given is that either lupins or corn are the two grains that are the most high in starch, and it's the starch content that gives you that big milk boost and gives the colostrum the boost. And it's very important to have that colostrum there when the lamb is born because it really boosts the mothering instinct between the mother and the lamb and that's sort of the foundation for the whole thing and uh, I've never used fibre beans I must admit but I've been advised that they're a great feed for young weaner years and that type of thing but corn and lupins would be preferable for pregnant ewes coming into lambing. Um, the next question is from Helen Darlington. What is the ideal time or range of pregnancy to scan? Chris, if you could just um, repeat that. Okay, for, yep, for wet and drying, just for pregnant or non-pregnant, you can, you know, scanners will be pretty happy to, you know, see those sheep about 80, 80, 70 or 80 days from the start of joining. And then for twins and singles, about three months. So three months after the rams have gone in, that gives you about the 90 days that's about the time that the scanner can give you the most accurate results. Excellent. Thank you. Final question is from Mark. What is the yard requirement to accommodate a contract scanner? That's over to you, Pat. I'm sorry, Nicole, what was that the yard content, was it? Yard requirements. I'm guessing how, how large a set of yards do you need to to have to get a contract scanner in? Well, I think depending on how many ewes you own, but if you've got um, quite a number of ewes, you need a fair-sized yard, I feel, because if they're doing two and a half, three thousand a day, you've got to have quite a few coming in and the same number going out. So you need a fair sort of a yard, I feel. You know, something that'll hold two or three thousand ewes probably, but um, obviously you can slow those guys down if you've got smaller facilities. But um, yeah, you need need pretty handy yards, and you need plenty of water to water them and keep the dust down and make the whole thing a bit more pleasant for the operators and the stock. But um, yeah, I would think you'd need something to hold two or three thousand sheep, because once they turn up, if they can do that number a day, two and a half, three thousand a day, they're only going to be there for one day generally, and they want them in and out. So uh, need pretty good yards to be able to handle that situation. Thank you. Okay. Can, can I make a comment there, just um, Nicole? A, a good question. That one. The thing with the scanning, and I sort of probably omitted to sort of say, but you've only got one chance. Once they're scanned and they're back out into the yard, you've got to remember whether they're, you know, single twin or or wet and dry. Um, so you really need to get that paint brand out on the nose or the head so that you can identify the the user to say carrying it. A twin, so you might put a red brand on the head of the twin bearing ewes if you're going to go that way. But also, you need to identify those dry ewes so that, you know, if they pop up next year, then you can identify them and, and, and cull them. Um, and so that they don't all mix together and all that good scanning information is lost. So you really need to be on the ball there. You know, gates come open and, you know, dogs charge at the ewes and they jump the fence and this sort of thing. You need to uh, be really on the ball to make sure that that um, you can identify them virtually the minute they've um, you know, come out of the scanning box. Thanks, Chris. So um, we're pretty much out of time now. So just to wrap up, I'd just like to thank um, 
both Chris and Pat for their time today and in presenting and preparing their presentations and answering all the questions. And thanks once again to our audience for asking all these great questions. It's been excellent.